Okay, wonderful. So the case that we're going to talk about today uh, was a rather substantial win in uh, tax court, uh, Bueller Tractor and uh, Bueller Versatile, which is a... Uh, um, they manufacture uh, large uh, chassis uh, agricultural tractors. They're in Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba. Um, the uh, relevant fiscal years, we're talking about 2005. Um, so I actually have a couple of different personal connections to this particular file. One of the things about being in Thunder Bay is uh, you do tend to reach into Manitoba because, of course, Kenora is uh, very much part of uh, northwestern Ontario. And uh, as it turns out, when I er, er, early in my career, um, I was seconded sort of uh, by the Business Development Bank. Um, there was a, uh, one of their BDC consulting partners, probably long retired now, um, he uh, he brought me over to meet uh, Willie Jansen, uh, and this was, I guess, this was just after this first uh, tangle with the CRA with uh, with Keith Crystal. Um, so they they actually the the RTA I'm very familiar with as well. I have uh, I have um, uh, conducted reviews and shred with uh, with the main RTA on this file um, many years ago. Um, but, uh, at, you know, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can supply some color commentary where I can. Um, anyway, so maybe I'll, 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 I'll move on a little bit here. Uh, in this particular case, uh, which really came as no surprise to me, uh, Mr. Crystal uh, sort of folded his arms and said that the work claimed by Bueller Tractor was routine testing, quality control, and product development. So uh, as such, he did not see a technological uncertainty uh, or an attempted technological advancement. Um, there were seven projects. Of course, uh, project five was the phase D tier two high horsepower. This was the this was the large uh, Cummins, uh, the largest format Cummins uh, uh, tractor, uh, which was prototyped. And um, this is where they decided they were going to focus the bulk of the representations in the course of the uh, Tax Court of Canada case. Um, so yes, the people, uh, Willie, he's a character. Um, uh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't get to meet anybody from Cummins, but uh, uh, they did contribute uh, certainly their technical technical expertise uh, to the project. Um, Keith. Uh, I mean, I, I don't. I don't know Scott either, but I, I definitely know Keith. And uh, this particular file uh, was handled by a senior manager at Price Waterhouse Cooper uh, for for this particular year in this filing. So, um, so what was the project objective? Uh, the goal is to create high horsepower four wheel drive tractors that meet tier two emissions, suitable for agricultural and commercial uh, applications. Um, he was looking at a more than 500 horsepower tractor, which uh, today are actually pretty common, uh, but at the time they were not. Um, the, uh, of course, the need for uh, for higher power tractors comes from the, the PTO requirements and the sort of larger area of farms and, and sort of reduced uh, manual labor. Um, the uh, So typically, yeah, here you go. So typically you're looking about 425%, or sorry, 425 horsepower, um, tier two emissions. Um, and, uh, and so the, uh, the issue here isn't so much just the, the motor, but there are a whole bunch of follow on things between the drivetrain and the cooling system in particular, which we'll get into. Um, there is uh, the argument was, and you know, we'll tipping my hand here, this was ultimately what the tax court agreed with, was that there was some system uncertainty that perhaps these components themselves were standard in nature or at least had their own sort of performance criteria. Uh, but the uh, result of combining these efforts resulted in some some unexpected uh, outcomes in uh, in performance testing and required some experimental development to overcome some of these observed uh, deficiencies. So um, the first one, the torsional coupler. So this is basically what connects the engine to the, to the transmission and the power requirements. Um, the 425 horsepower, so the, we'll take that as the standard, used a uh, rubber coupler. Um, but of course, the QSX15. So that was the 500, and, uh, 500 plus horsepower uh, Cummins engine. Um, it, it was dimensionally larger. So the result, the resulting requirement was that the drive shaft, um, instead of being on a flat plane, which is typically uh, like an inline zero degree angle, um, based on the dimensions of the engine, it had to uh, 
the, the drive shaft had to exist in a five degree operating angle between the crankshaft and the transmission input shaft. Um, now, uh, in testing, they observed a whipping motion uh, on it, obviously the mechanics of um, both having you know, the forces applied uh, torsionally and, and, and at an angle it resulted in some unexpected behavior. And it did, in fact, greatly reduce the lifespan of the coupler. Uh, typically, the couplers last 5,000 hours, uh, and, uh, and they, uh, they were getting less than 100 hours out of the coupler uh, as a result. Now, the other piece of the puzzle here is the cooling. And this is also relevant to me. I mean, I have a, um, I'm sure many of you do too. Uh, if you have a heavy industrial uh, clients or heavy industrial equipment uh, manufacturers, I have a hard rock surface drill uh, manufacturer in my client base. When they're taking engines that are designed for road trucks or, or other applications that aren't either stationary or low speed, part of the cooling system and part of how that cooling system is designed for that motor, it takes into account that under load, uh, as the vehicle is moving, there's obviously some airflow over the, um, uh, over the radiator and the cooling system in order to facilitate the evacuation of heat. Um, but if the vehicle is sitting on its own or, or moving at a much slower speed, like a tractor as compared to a, to a road truck, um, then you don't have sufficient uh, airflow over the motor to facilitate cooling. It makes it more difficult. Uh, furthermore, um, dusty uh, conditions are also an issue. I mean, sure, you can drive a tractor trailer or a road truck on dirt roads, but uh, if you're operating it in fields with you know, pollen and, and you know, all, all sorts of other uh, uh, contaminants, then that certainly uh, impedes your ability to have an effective and efficient cooling system as well. Uh, so yeah, 535 horsepower was the rating for the QSX-15. Um, the, uh, as far as their base level knowledge, obviously they had worked with uh, less powerful motors, but that didn't necessarily inform because of the technological challenges of, well, starting with accommodating a larger sized motor. Um, uh, you know, they didn't, they didn't have a, a flat plane uh, introduction of torque into the transmission input shaft. Um, so, I mean, while they did have experience with high horsepower tractors, none had the dimensions or specifically the, the you know, power and torque requirements of this particular motor. Um, and, uh, but at least they did have some input from Cummins engineers uh, in the course. And they'll be talking about uh, intake manifold uh, temperature shortly as, as one of their indicating factors in their experiments, which demonstrated that what they were doing was uh, not uh, standard in nature. So we'll, uh, we'll get to that. The key variables, um, again, summarizing the um, dust and low airflow as compared to uh, uh, road tractor applications or road applications of the QSX-15. Um, airflow pressure effects, uh, cooler face orientations and shapes. So if you're not getting the airflow that you need over your radiator, then it would follow that you would have larger dimensions of cooling faces uh, available to you. But of course, they've also got dimensional restraints on that as well. The tractor uh, can only be so big. Um, uh, interestingly, in the course of their experimentation, they ended up widening the tractor chassis twice uh, in order to increase the, um, the surface area available for cooling and for fin design. Now, um, the torsional coupler, um, the whipping motion resulting from the five degree angle uh, um, transmission of power from the motor to the to to the transmission slip joint design. Uh, we'll get into that shortly, and uh, the materials used therein. So, um, in their experimentation. Well, originally the rubber coupling, the LCD. Um, it uses a series of. So they decided they were not going to use the rubber, and they were going to use springs. Um, which uh, dampen and, uh, and, and assist in the transmission. So the spring couplers were made by torsion control. Um, torsion, torsion couplers should last, there we go, should last over 5,000 hours, but failing after less than 100 hours of the QSX-15. So um, uh, that would be an observation indicating that obviously this is not meeting its, uh, its intended performance criteria. So um, transmission, of course, multiple gears, shafts, and bearings. Uh, torsional coupler is needed to isolate and minimize vibration. Um, QSX-15s 
uh, are, uh, well, diesel engines generally uh, have a fair bit of vibration. And when you're uh, when you're applying that vibration to a whole bunch of sensitive gears, and of course each of the transmission and the and the motor will also have um, also have engine mounts to try and isolate from that uh, as well. Um, the uh, yeah, so forcing the engine power to go through it, right, and the dampening affects the rest of the drive line. So that um, the the purpose of the torsional coupler is to is to reduce the effect directly of the engine's um, vibration and harshness. Uh, in, into uh, into downstream uses of its power. So <clears throat> this is an interesting uh, piece here because very often, and, and you'll, I'm sure you've experienced this as well, where Siri will say, "Well, you know, why'd you have to build a whole tractor? What uh, you know, why why couldn't you uh, why couldn't you observe this in, uh, in in a bench testing setup?" Well, this is a very interesting um, uh, revelation in the course of this uh, case. Uh, case. Um, the bench testing, well, the, the failures that they observed in bench testing were not the same as the ones that they observed in the field. I, mean, I, I don't know if you intended the pun there, field, uh, David, but uh, um, of course, bench testing typically has steady state loads, where in the field, the loads would be intermittent spikes uh, based on the terrain and based on what the uh, what the tractor is experiencing in its real world usage. So in this case, the bench testing, although it was done, and, and we'll get into the whole um, you know, what theories they're applying when and, and how they relate to the hypothesis. But, um, but the, uh, uh, the, the, in this case, the bench testing could not inform or address the observed technological obstacles uh, because it didn't, uh, it didn't fully uh, explain or it didn't fully replicate the, uh, the, the failures that they were seeing in real world testing. So uh, there were some other hypotheses um, that maybe it was failing due to axle thrust loads. Um, there's a slip joint in there. Um, maybe the slip joint wasn't slipping as intended, or there was uh, too much friction based on the high torque, um, which would prevent the slip. Um, so there were some other, uh, it wasn't necessarily just the uh, intermittent spike loads, that there were some other, uh, other challenges observed. Uh, or, or at least some other um, hypotheses that might explain why they were experiencing the failures that they were. Uh, <clears throat> so how do they test that? Well, um, they uh, tested the coupler and drive shaft measurement of actual in-service loads outfitted with a strain gauge, uh, attempted to measure the torque passing through the coupler and the drive shaft. One way to answer the question. So at the end of this work, uh, they were using, if you remember, they started with rubber uh, and then they, I guess they had a nine spring iteration of the uh, torsion assembly and they went up to 12 springs, larger, heavier, also more durable, more expensive. Um, so it didn't necessarily meet all of their criteria, but, uh, but it, it, it did at least meet um, in field uh, performance criteria. So th this is this is where I, you know, because of course we we're, we're using why and how to evaluate the, the merits of uh, of a case, but I, I do appreciate that the judge said um, they didn't always know whether a specific theory would successfully resolve a particular issue, but they always they always knew why they were testing the theory. Um, so they were focused and methodical in the way they uncovered, recognized, and resolved issues in cooling and torsional. Uh, as as those these two examples demonstrate uh, some other larger challenges that they've had with the motor, uh, so rubber to spring, um, uh, they didn't know the springs would necessarily work. Uh, but as the iterations moved through, of course, they had more springs, in twelve instead of nine, um, and the uh, they had a two piece welded and ultimately a one piece uh, design. So there was evidence of changes, and the changes were consistent with the observed. Uh, performance and and any subsequent hypotheses uh, could be tied to to their subsequent attempts. Let's talk about cooling a little bit here, shall we? Thin spacing. So, I mean, uh, some of you might have seen heat sinks uh, or obviously radiators, right? I mean, it's the same idea is that you're uh, you're looking to increase the surface area uh, of something with uh, with a high temperature such that that uh, heat can be dissipated. Uh, hopefully with airflow, sometimes with fans, perhaps, or in the case of a road vehicle, of course, uh, um, the motion of the vehicle uh, will add
add to the airflow as well. Uh, but here they were challenged by the need to accommodate the physical size of the components as well. Each component had protrusions called fins, right? So it so it looks um, um, well. Okay, there we go. All right. So the surface area, although you've got you know maybe this is your this is your let me see if I can turn on the track, right? You turn here, you got your surface area here, except you've got more surface area because you've got all of these little fins in between there too. Um, so the protrusions fins increase the surface area. Uh, the tighter the fin spacing, yes, the heat rejection is better, but the airflow is worse, right? Um, you don't have as much airflow in between uh, the fins if you've got less space between them. Um, and I did make reference earlier, uh, they did have to ultimately widen the chassis of the tracker twice uh, in order to house the necessary components for it to meet its cooling uh, requirements. And of course, how do you how do you test whether your cooling is effective? Well, you use dyno testing, dynamometer. I mean, this is very much an automotive thing. Um, you would apply loads uh, uh, to the motor where it's not going anywhere. Um, it's it's set up in a controlled environment, but um, you know they would run. In this case, it would run full throttle six to eight hours at a time, uh, and they would be testing uh, thirty variables, including temperatures, pressures, flow. Um, they're in, in an attempt uh, to evaluate the efficacy of the cooling system. So in this case, bench testing can tell you a little bit more uh, than, um, than they could have in the, in the um, torque application because um, the airflow can be replicated, right? Or, or, or lack of airflow, or they can add uh, fans or whatever cooling mechanisms they need. But here we go, intake manifold temperature differential. So this was a um, uh, system spec from Cummins. So this is where uh, Cummins internal expertise would, uh, would assist. Um, so they required air to be cooled by at least 63 degrees while the engine was operating at maximum horsepower. Um, so the appellate changed the design of the charge air cooler uh, to create turbulent airflow, increased cooling, but reduced the air pressure uh, inside the charge air cooler. Uh, so when they were, although they were increasing the air pressure, um, and when they did, uh, it resulted in an unacceptable intake manifold temperature differential. So they weren't able to meet the 63 degree gradient. Uh, so ultimately, they did have to increase the face area of the charge air cooler, uh, but in turn had to reduce the size of the oil coolers uh, mounted underneath. Um, so they put the tractors through a suite of other tests, noise levels, steering, rollover protection, braking, air conditioning, powertrain, manual, bump track, hydraulic, and air seeder. Um, so uh, the end result, um, well, and, and you can see that obviously relevant to both the powertrain and the cooling, uh, they did make a limited number of these tractors uh, for uh, a prototype production uh, late in 2005. Uh, but when the project ended, the appellant sold the IP um, for $2.6 in 2017. So, uh, rounding it out here, um, the judge indicated that he was in the view that the technological uncertainty fits squarely under the description of system uncertainty, right? The inter integration of non-trivial combinations of established and well-known technology principles carried a major element of technological uncertainty. So that was a huge win. Um, when all of these individual parts are combined, their individual uncertainties merged into a system uncertainty, and the system uncertainty was, in fact, the entire tractor, right? You couldn't use bench testing to establish the um, uh, problems with, uh, with, with uh, applying the force from the motor to the transmission input shaft. You needed the tractor, you needed the in-field expertise, in this case, actually field, uh, in order to, to replicate some of the observed failures. But all the constituent parts needed to function in unison in order to achieve the appellant's objective. Um, so uh, the ruling on costs, well, this, this is where it gets a little bit unfair, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, so the 535 horsepower tractor was one of three models in the line. The 435 and 485 didn't have the same system uncertainty because, of course, they didn't have the same input shaft or necessarily the same cooling requirements. Um, so uh, yeah, the judge said on a principal basis, about one third of $2.9 million of qualifying expenditures. Um, but uh, Dave and I were talking about this before the start of the uh, um, uh, webinar this afternoon. 
it seems a bit unfair because it's likely that based on all this additional work required for the 535, um, that it would be much more lopsided. It would be at least half of that expenditure, if not more. So that might have been a point of argument. Um, but uh, so it goes. Um, and uh, yeah, so the uh, implications. Uh, excellent evidence of eligible work for machinery and automotive industries, for sure. And uh, the strong technical backgrounds of the researchers, the um, the experts hired, uh, the participants, the participation of Cummins uh, in respect of the, particularly the cooling, right, the intake manifold temperature differential. Um, but of course, uh, you could have argued that it would have, you know, yes, there were three tractors. It was one tractor that... Uh, that, that met all of these definitions of system uncertainty, but good Lord, it was probably more than uh, a third of the costs. And uh, well, I think that'll be it for now.